Speaking in Dark Times is a podcast series by Ukraine World. In this episode, I speak to Anna Pilbaum about the deep roots of the Ukrainian resistance, the history of Russian totalitarianism, KGB politics, and the cult of impunity. Anna Pilbaum is an American journalist and historian, Pulitzer Prize winner, author of numerous books about Eastern Europe and global politics, and the Washington Post columnist. My name is Volodymyr Yermolenko. I'm a Ukrainian philosopher, journalist, and chief editor of Ukraine World. Ukraine World is a website in English about Ukraine run by Ukrainians. It is brought to you by Internews Ukraine, one of the biggest Ukrainian media NGOs. The serious thinking in dark times aims to make Ukraine and the current war a focal point of our common reflection about the world's present, past and future. We try to see light through and despite the current darkness. You can support us at patreon.com slash Ukraine world. So let's start. Annie Baum, thanks so much for joining this podcast. Thanks for inviting me. So... Uh, there is a discussion, lots of discussion about the beginnings of this war. And uh, I personally was surprised how many people in the West were surprised with the Ukrainian resistance. So it, it came as a, as a kind of a big surprise for many people in the West uh, that Ukraine will resist so much. Was it a surprise for you? No, it wasn't a surprise. And I'm very fortunate to have been asked about this on the record on a, with someone using a camera at the Munich Security Conference a couple of days before the invasion. And I said there would be a resistance. So I wasn't entirely surprised. Obviously, I didn't predict exactly the outcome of the war. Um, but, you know, the Western military experts, some of whom are very good, um, have spent many, many, many years studying Russia Um, you know, there are whole teams of people who sit in German, you know, air bases and military army bases in, in Europe and just watch Russian tank movements. And they've been doing that for decades now. Um, they know a lot about it. They know the generals. They know the equipment. They keep track of what Russia buys, what it has, what it doesn't have. They count how many tanks Russia has. My impression is that they don't have anything like that, or they didn't at that time, 10 months ago. They didn't have anything like that knowledge of Ukraine or the Ukrainian military forces. Um, you know, Ukraine wasn't an old, um, you know, longstanding uh, ally of the United States. You know, it wasn't like Britain or, or France or even Australia. Um, there weren't deep relationships between Ukrainian military officers and leaders and, and NATO officers and leaders as there are, you know, with, with other countries. Um, and so I think I think there was just a lot of lack of knowledge about what what the Ukrainian army would do and what the military would do. And I think that explains how why there was this enormous underestimation of the Ukrainian response. If we look at the Ukrainian, let's say, political history, and I'm using the concept political culture, if I don't know if you agree with this concept. And I have the impression studying Ukrainian intellectual history is that Uh, there is something very deep in in, in the way how Ukrainians uh, uh, have what what attitude do they have towards the empire towards tyranny, and we have much longer history of this resistance towards uh, against tyranny. We have uh, much more decentralized political culture than than in Russia, and this is probably one of the the causes of this resistance too. Would you agree with this? Yeah, I do, and I think that's another thing that's not very well understood. Um, outside of Ukraine. I mean, again, you know, my, my belief that Ukraine would resist was based mostly not on my knowledge of the Ukrainian military, but on my knowledge of Ukrainian history. And it was exactly this. It's this um, grassroots, grassroots based way of acting. It's this kind of um, almost grassroots identity, which is even different from this, which, you know, and, and which sometimes is a problem for Ukraine. Um, it's different sometimes from that of the state. You know, people don't necessarily identify with the state and state institutions, but they identify with a kind of broader, older identity. Um, and the habit of resistance to whatever empire is in charge at the moment, whether it's the Soviet empire or the Russian empire, um, you know, is is ingrained very deep. And it goes back into family histories and people would know 
you know, peop- you know, most Ukrainians would have some stories in their family of, of whether it was the 1918 or whether it was 1932 or whether it was, um, you know, a wartime resistance or stories of resistance, they would know it. Um, and so the, the, you know, the sense of needing to defend identity or defend a way of life against, against even an overpowering um, empire, imperial power, you know, simply goes back hundreds of years. Um, and so once you know that, and once you know a bit of Ukrainian history, you aren't that surprised. But as I said, I, you know, I started with Western military experts. It's also true that even people who studied the region, who know Russian history, and there are a lot of them in the U.S. who know, you know, who know a lot about Russia or this or Soviet history, tend not to have studied Ukrainian history. Um, or if they have, it's fairly superficial. And so again, this awareness of this long history of resistance was, I think, lacking. I don't think it will be now, by the way. I mean, there's almost been a kind of mad rush to catch up on Ukrainian history and Ukrainian history books become bestsellers um, over the last year. So I think that's that's now changed probably for good. But it was certainly 10 months ago, that was certainly the case. But it's not only about Ukrainian history, because uh, when we look at the way how scholars uh, worldwide study Eastern Europe, they primarily focus on the probably on the past centuries. They focus on Soviet Union, they focus on the 19th century, and maybe on the 18th century, starting from Peter I. And this is where uh, all these three centuries were centuries of expansion of empire, not only the Russian Empire, but also Habsburg Empire or Ottoman Empire. But uh, if I tell you that there is an alternative history, well, not alternative, but the other history of Eastern Europe, which would say that it is not imperial history, it would rather a history of a certain republicanism, the Ukrainian Cossack statehood, then Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, then even coming back to uh, to the medieval times. So would you agree with that? Would you agree that there is this non-imperial history of Eastern Europe? Uh, I mean, of course I would agree with it, and I've written some of it, a little bit of it myself, or referred to it myself. Um, but, you know, most kind of schools of modern history in the Western world, and this is, you know, in, in, the, in the English language, in German, in French, um, arose in the 19th century. Um, and this, by the way, is a problem not just for Ukraine, it's a problem for Poland, which was also a state that did not exist in the 19th century. Um, and that means that, um, w- you know, when history books were first being written and the concept of modern European history emerged, um, actually mostly in Germany and then later elsewhere. Um, those countries, countries that were not at that time world powers were left out. Uh, and the kind of, I don't know how to describe it, with, what's the right word to describe it, but the, the, the way of seeing history as a kind of clash of world powers or of great powers, which today finds, a, finds its... Um, you know, expression in the so-called realist school of international relations, I think it comes from that time. Um, and, it, you know, it's actually very difficult to get almost any country to think about deeper, older history. Um, you know, the, the history of the Middle Ages is studied pretty superficially uh, in the United States. Um, you know, I guess the British study the Tudors because they're very dramatic, you know, Henry VIII and his many wives and so on. Um, but, but they're, you know, getting getting um, getting anybody to think back beyond the 19th century is pretty difficult. So I don't, and it's not just a problem for Ukraine. If we look at at Russia and Russian imperialism, I think there are several ways to look at it. What is happening with it now? Uh, one of the way is to say, okay, this is another rebirth of Russian imperialism. Russia wants to conquer more lands, and um, and this is kind of a circular circular way. It's the same story that happened in 19th century and 20th century. Another way to think about it is to say that no, Russian imperialism is actually in decline. And it knows that it is in decline. It is not comfortable with this fact. And therefore it tries, it accumulates all the forces to to prevent this decline. Uh, what what is what 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 description which description is is closer to you? So I think the latter description actually is pretty mainstream um, that, you know, that that Russia is seeking to put off an inevitable change, you know, that uh, 
um, that the end of the Soviet Union marked a shift in the nature of you know Russian power and influence that um, you know that 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 the Russian Empire as it was at its height you know which I suppose you you would probably say was 1945 when when Russian or rather at that time Soviet troops were in Berlin um, that that you know the the the, this, the 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 empire has receded a lot since then, and that this represents a kind of revanchist attempt to take back territory or to take back territory that was once part of the Russian Empire at one point and no longer is. Um, you know, and so yes, I do think that's a that's an accurate way of looking about it. It also explains, um, you know, this isn't a you know this you know the Russian Empire at the moment is not a positive outward looking, you know, um, kind of joyful project. It's, this isn't empire building for the sake of the spread of the glory of Russian civilization or Russian culture um, or, or Russian religion. You know, when you think about how past empires spread or what imperial ideology looked like in other times and other places, you know, this is an angry, you know, genocidal lashing out at neighbors, you know, murderous, you know, the Russians, the Russians don't bring civilization, they bring death, you know, they don't bring enlightenment, they bring, you know, the end of education, you know, they don't bring anything positive, they just bring destruction. Um, and that's not, you know, that's not what other empires have looked like, or not even how they thought of themselves or spoke about themselves at their height over the century. So even the fact that the Russians themselves don't speak about bringing anything positive into the world. Um, I think it tells you almost everything you see. You need to know this. It's a, it's a revanchist. It's a backlash. It's an attempt to avoid um, what looks like an inevitable decline. It's already an economic decline. You know, next it's going to become a military and political decline as well. I would I would agree with that uh, because if we look at uh, at other cases of Russian imperialism, there was. Uh, more or less always kind of a, a positive a positive project a positive I don't mean ethically positive but at least there is there was some statement we see that in the 19th century in in pan Slavic idea or Byzantine idea we see that of course in the 20th century there is an idea that Russia is Soviet Union is actually bringing some alternative world order and this world order was horrible but it was it was clear, clearly defined. Whereas now we don't understand what Russia is trying to bring, and that that leads me to to the next question. Uh, I I think you're right that uh, Russia sees 1945 as a kind of a, the, its golden age. It wants to come back to this golden age, and that means that um, while it seeks the reasons for this golden age, the the key reason, the key cause of 1945 for Russia is Stalinism. So consciously or unconsciously, it wants to come back to to Stalinism, but it, its leadership is not uh, not young, not energetic. Uh, it's it's rather old leadership, Putin and Shoigu and, and 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 others around him. So it it tries to be Stalinism, but it looks much more like Brezhnevism, like people which are unable to, which don't have energy actually. So does it? Does it does Putinism look more like Stalinism or Brezhnevism for you? So to me, it's never looked like Stalinism. I mean, it's becoming it's harsher now, obviously, than it was a decade ago. Um, Putin has never, in the past and up until now, and of course that could change. He's never been interested in mass violence. You know, he has not arrested a million people or killed hundreds of thousands of people um, as Stalin did, and his tactic was always somewhat different, you know, that if you can arrest a few people, you can scare everybody else. Um, and if you can use this kind of disabling propaganda, so propaganda that makes people apathetic or makes them think they can't do anything about politics or makes them um, afraid even to talk about or think about politics or political public life or, 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 or any kind of common social life, you know, then you can then you can keep power without this kind of mass bloodletting, and that is a lot more like Brezhnevism um, than it is like Stalinism. And actually, what it's really like is Andropovism. I mean, Andropov wasn't alive very long, or he wasn't. Sorry, he was alive for a long time, but he wasn't Secretary General of the Communist Party for that long. But he had a very clear theory. Um, he believed that um, any evidence of 
any conversation about democracy, any civil society, however small and apparently puny or weak, it had to be crushed. Um, and so this in the 1980s, first as the, as the KGB boss and then as the head of the Communist Party, um, he went around crushing what were then very small groups of dissidents, you know, small little intellectual groups in Moscow and actually in Kiev as well, um, just to make sure that the sort of virus of democracy or the virus of free speech or whatever you want to call it, the virus of, of, of liberal values couldn't spread. And he believed in kind of crushing it at the lowest level possible. Um, Putin is well known to be a great admirer of Andropov. He um, put up a portrait of Andropov in, um, in, uh, in the FSB headquarters when he first uh, became boss there. Uh, he's put up a few statues to him in St. Petersburg as well. Um, he, he came, you know, came into adulthood as a, as a young man in the, in the KGB when it was kind of, when it was Andropov's KGB. And so he, you know, he, I, I, my feeling is that he's always thought very much along these lines. Um, you know, again, the belief that you just should just crush everything at the lowest level and not allow any kind of civil society at all. I mean, the first couple of decades, um, when he was in power, he tried something different, which is something more like, it's been described recently by Sergei Guryev and and, um, and and Daniel Treisman as spin dictatorship, as a kind of, as I said, just make a few examples of people and then try and keep control with, um, you know, with with propaganda. And now he seems to be reverting to this Andropovism, you know, just crush any form of civil society wherever you see it. So shut down memorial, you know, shut down. Um, any any organizations of mothers of soldiers, you know, anything that looks like um, any, any even an apolitical form of of civic organization that that needs to be shut down. And so it does look very much like that. And of course, that was very much a kind of you know final phase of the Soviet project. Thank you for bringing this in because in in our Ukrainian context, of course, this is this is very important. The seventies and the eighties. Uh, despite visible some some efforts of change or, or uh, despite the stagnation, the zastoy, what we call it, uh, the persecution of the dissidents continued, of Ukrainian dissidents, and even went harsher in the 70s and early early 80s. But uh, what what I feel very bad about this Andropov and, and Putin for Russia and for Russian history is that this line of KGB uh, rulers, uh, because KGB for me is is those people who actually were murderers in in the thirties, and you described it in in several of your books about Gulag and about the Holodomor, the Red Famine, and the problem is that they took power. So murderers who actually had to be convicted for for murdering people without any any trials, they. Uh, uh, showed they they presented themselves as judges, and this is a horrible thing which happened in the Soviet history and, and R- Russian history because the pyramid uh, the, the pyramid of justice has become reversed. Those people who are murderers said that no, we are not murderers. We are we are judges. We are on the right side of everything. And the problem is when we compare uh, the Russian history with I don't know fascism and Nazism. It's not only the point to compare the scale of crimes, I think, or their ideology, is to say that, look, uh, fascism and Nazism were condemned and and were put uh, to the margins of the Western society, whereas in this geography, in Eastern Europe, those people who committed uh, crimes have actually took taken power and are still in power in Russia. And this is something which can lead us to a very profound and horrible thought about this impunity of those people. So do you think that the, the current war is can be read as a continuation of, of the Russian uh, or KGB uh, tactics to, to ensure impunity? So in my first history book, in my book about the Gulag, I had a whole final epilogue or kind of chapter on this question of impunity and on memory. And the, the, you know, the question that I kept running into as I traveled around Russia in the 1990s, I went to archives all over the country. I went in Moscow, I went to Novosibirsk, I was in uh, Karelia, you know, where the White Sea Canal had been built. 
Um, I went to many different places. I went to Vorkuta, I should say. Um, and everywhere I went, I found some people who wanted to talk about the past. And, and I had a lot of people, Russians, helping me find material and, and put together the book. And that, but I also met people who immediately questioned me, why are you doing this? You know, you're, I mean, obviously I'm American. So why is an American interested in this? Why don't you write about our cosmonauts, you know, or, or the great things that the Soviet Union achieved? And this, this kind of, this refusal to acknowledge the past or a refusal to see the crimes of the past and to talk about them and expose them has, was a problem in Russia from, I mean, literally from 1991 onwards. And there were a few attempts to do it. Um, there was a kind of trial of the Communist Party under Boris Yeltsin that never really went anywhere. Um, there, were, there was Memorial, which is the great, um, of course, the great um, Russian Historical Society and Human Rights Society, which, which really did actually write, you know, put together document collections, books, they published memoirs, they did an enormous amount of work trying to tell the story of what had happened in Russia and in the Soviet Union in the 20th century. Um, you know, you had, a, you had a few monuments built around, you know, I, I went to see most of them, I think, you know, sometimes in very obscure places, quite moving ones. But what you never had was a moment of, you know, Pukayanya, you know, you never had a moment of remorse or national apology or a sense that, you know, that, that this was bad and that the perpetrators should be tried or punished or even just condemned, you know, publicly. Um, and that never happened in Russia. And the absence of that moment, um, I think, is one of the reasons why we're seeing what we're seeing now. So the the sense that there was something evil done, and that the KGB, who were the who were in charge of the of this incredibly evil, um, you know, international project, in fact, because the the Gulag um, contained people not only from Russia, not only from Ukraine, but from Poland, from the Baltic states, actually from Europe as well, uh, Western Europe as well. Uh, and yet there was never a moment of apology or sorrow for it. No, no national moment. And there wasn't really a, um, you know, a coming to terms with it in any in any real way. Um, and that is part of why it was possible for, um, in, in effect, the KGB and Putin was a younger KGB officer, you know, in the in the 1980s, why it was possible for that group of people to come to power again, because they weren't identified by most Russians, or really by anybody else, as the perpetrators, um, and you're and you're right. They 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 therefore managed, to, as you say, turn the pyramid of morality on its head, um, and they made themselves the in in charge of history and in charge of um, and, and you know in, in charge of deci- defining what modern Russia would be, um, and they and they created a modern Russia that, from the very beginning, was kind of built around this concept of resentment and loss. You know, we lost our empire. You know, 1989, 1991; these were disasters. Um, you know, we 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 suffered at the hands of the West, and they and Russia was not led by people who saw it, the potential for a moment of rebirth. And there were people who saw it. I mean, if you look back on what people were writing in Russia in the late 1980s during the perestroika period, when you look back on what people hoped for at that time, there was a hope for a kind of moral rebirth or something different. You know, Russia could be a European country or it could be a normal country. Um, it didn't have to be a country of death and destruction and, and you know, something, you know, a place that creates fear for its neighbors. But that kind of Russia was not, you know, th- those ideas for Russia were not the ones that won. And Putin and Putinism won partly through the forces of apathy, partly because of the forces of resentment, partly because those were the people who had the money. Um, they were the ones who, at the end of the Soviet empire, um, put themselves in charge of most of the country's natural resources. I mean, you know, that's a long story, and there are many good books written about it. I'm just doing a brief version of it here. But there was never at the at, you know, at the heart of the new Russia, as Putin conceived it from the end of the 1990s onwards, um, there was never an idea that we need to repudiate the Soviet Union or we need to apologize for the Soviet Union or we need to, um, you know, undo even just the damage that the Soviet Union did to Russia and to Russians. Um, you know, it was never it was always it was always about regaining what the Soviet Union had lost. I think this this is what uh, what makes a difference between 
let's say, Western imperialisms and Russian imperialism, uh, of course there is Western imperialism. There is, there is a horrible story of the Western imperialism of British, French, Belgian, American, whatever else. But uh, this moment of repentance is, is very present, at, at least from the 20th century. We can criticize it. We can say that it is not really sincere in some ways. We can say that it is not going uh, too far, um, etc. But uh, in Russia, indeed, it, it never existed, this, this moment of repentance, right? And uh, maybe this explains also one of the explanations of this war, uh, do you see that this war, the war crimes that Russia is doing in Ukraine, as a as a kind of a, this psychological feeling that look, I was not punished for those crimes that I did in the past, so I will not be punished even today, and therefore it opens my uh, my my arms to do anything that I want. I think that's part of it. Um, the sense that you know, this sense, as you say, of impunity that comes in part from this KGB experience of not ever being made to pay a price for the terrible things that they did as, as sometimes as individuals and certainly as an institution. Um, I mean, I think there's another element as well, which is that I think Putin understands very well that all of these rules um, that were created, I mean, f- frankly, by the UN and in some cases with Soviet participation, you know, the laws of war and the you know, um, declarations of human rights and declarations against genocide, you know, he he sees all of these rules as somehow shoring up a world order, you know, a a basis for commerce and trade and peaceful negotiation um, that's, that's been particularly transformative for Europe, which was a continent where people fought each other for centuries and, and since 1945 don't. Um, But he, he sees them as part of this order that he wants to topple. So he wants the world order wrecked. He doesn't like the world order. He doesn't like the, you know, the rules that underline this kind of peaceful exchanges and so on. And he wants something different because he thinks that Russia doesn't have a large enough or an influential enough role in this world. Um, And that's actually one of the things that at least until recently, and this might be changing, was one of the things that made Russia different from China. You know, China, China was a um, again, until recently, was a kind of status quo power that liked the system of international rules and laws because it was doing well out of them. Um, and Russia did not like it because Russia saw that it was, or believed, I, I think wrongly, but Putin believed, and in any case, that that he he and his regime were not doing well out of them. So, so part of what's happening, you know, as as was the case in Syria, by the way, um, where this was, where this was also an important aspect of of that horrible war. Um, part of what he's doing is showing, I didn't care about your rules. You know, I can commit genocide. I can commit murder. I can attack civilians. I can, you know, break all the laws of war. And I don't care because I don't, I don't want these rules to exist and I don't want them to have any power. And of course, international law only, you know, unlike normal law, I mean, there isn't a, a higher power to, to make you pay a price. So it's only as good as the, as the countries that respect it. Um, and so what he's trying to do is upend this international order and replace it with something different, you know, a kind of might makes right world where Russia can do whatever it wants. Yeah, I think the key difference is that international order, what was trying to make since the World War II, is to invent rules that will limit violence, uh, right? So, yes. okay, we, we accept that there are wars in the world, but let's, 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 uh, let's make them confined to certain rules and let's make them as limited as possible uh, in violence. Whereas Putinism, and I think it's, it's, it's very deep actually in, in the Russian culture, maybe culture of violence, uh, it is actually trying to, to seek violence that will limit the rules. So absolutely different procedure, not seek rules that will limit the violence, but seek violence that will limit the rules or, or destroy the rules. And this is kind of this idea of freedom that, look, I'm I'm destroying the rules. Yeah, I think I was going to say, I think that's absolutely right. You know, freedom, you know, they, and they, sometimes they use this word sovereignty, you know, with which they don't mean it in the normal sense that you and I mean it. They mean freedom to, you know, we can do whatever we want both inside our country and outside our country because we have sovereignty. And I think Putin deeply believes that some states have this sovereignty and some don't. And Russia has it and Ukraine doesn't and probably Poland doesn't. 
but you know, lar- you know, it, so it's a it's a it's a different understanding of what um, what sovereignty means, what freedom means, and what um, international order means. Yeah, and it's important to see how some Russian ideologists like uh, Dugin they actually take the word sovereignty from Karl Schmidt, and if you look at Karl Schmidt. Sovereignty means precisely taking risks, right, and uh, and actually playing with violence and death. Uh, let me let me ask you about the West. Well, we understand the all uh, difficulties with the very concept of the West. We understand that West is divided, etc. But uh, can we still talk about it? And uh, if yes, do you think there is something? A very substantial that the West didn't understand about Putinism since 20, uh, uh, 2008, since Putin's invasion, actually Medvedev's invasion uh, of Georgia, and of course since 2014. And what doesn't it understand about Russia and Putinism now? So here, I, you know, you, 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 you hinted at this already in your question. I mean, you have to be careful what you mean by the West. There are different parts of the West and there are different leaders in the West and they actually aren't a united group. They don't have a similar understanding of Russia. Um, And even inside different countries, you know, if you look at France, you know, you have a whole very large, you know, probably the second largest now political grouping in France, um, which is pro-Russian, you know, and kind of openly so. Um, This is Marine Le Pen's um, far right party. And you have elements like that around, around Europe. And I mean, the rest of the world is a different problem. But um, so, so it's hard to be. So, I don't want to be overly general. Um, you know, if you if you talk about Americans, um, I think Americans were, for a long time, first of all, inclined to see Russia as a, you know, as we said already, as a as a kind of failing, dying power, as a regional power that was of less importance than other powers. So, you know, well, and there's always still actually even this week there's this argument in the U.S. You know, we should really care about China and not Russia. Why are we paying so much attention to Russia? Um, and that, of course, was a misunderstanding of what you know dying and weak powers are capable of. Um, and the, you know, the the idea that Russia wasn't going to just go away or somehow fade off the map or just disappear into nothing, um, and that might even become more dangerous as it grew weaker. I think this was a big misunderstanding of a lot of people in this particular problem for the Obama administration, for example. Um, the, sec- the second kind of misunderstanding um, was that Russia is a purely transactional power. You know, so we can, we can do deals with them. You know, we can buy their gas. We can sell them whatever cars. And, um, you know, and that way we'll, we'll have a sort of normal, various kind of normal relationship with them. And we just won't have to get into their politics. And this was, you know, roughly, for example, the understanding of Germany, you know, or actually the understanding of the Trump administration, you know, this kind of power that we, 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 we just have a trading relationship with, and we can ignore their politics. Um, and I think this, this understanding, which is pretty widespread, um, and there are versions of this you can find in Germany, in France, in the UK, as well as the US, um, you know, this misunderstood the um, the kind of ideological nature of Putinism and also the, you know, the, the profound hatred of liberal democracy, of democratic ideas, and the fear that these ideas could poison Russia, you know, or could, um, could, could create in Russia some kind of opposition to Putin and to Putinism. Um, and that and that Putin all the time, I mean, I think from before 2008, actually, um, was always thinking about, you know, how do I prevent these ideas from spreading? And that, and, and that you know, and his, his tactics included both um, pressure and um, interference in the economic and political affairs of his neighbors. It also eventually included interference in the politics of, you know, America, of France, of Britain, um, you know, and it was always as a way of um, break. You know, again, seeking to undermine the European Union, seeking to undermine NATO, seeking to undermine the Western alliances and the ideals that hold together the Western alliance, um, as a way of protecting himself and his regime. Um, and that kind of ideological side of Putin and Putinism, really, people did not want to see. I mean, it. You know, it was just partly they didn't want to see it because so many modern Western states are also founded on this kind of pragmatic idea. You know, the point of government is to to increase prosperity. And, you know, we have election campaigns in which one side 
argues against the other side, or we had for a long time, one side argues against the other side on the basis of whose economic plan is better. You know, the state should be bigger or smaller, or taxes should be higher or lower, or, um, you know, more or less companies should be state owned. I mean, wh- whatever, the, you know, the arguments were basically economic. And what Putinism was, was an argument that no politics isn't really about economics. It's about, you know, atavistic ideas about power, um, about um, as we this old this this strange um, uh, concept of sovereignty, uh, you know, and that and that and that you know, and that his attitude to the West is colored by that and not by a desire to make money and trade. Um, you know, personally, he made all his money already you know, twenty years ago, so he doesn't need the money, and he doesn't care about the prosperity of ordinary Russians. And that I think was really hard for. Western leaders to understand, and some of them still don't understand it. I mean, a lot still imagine that, you know, if we could just get back to where we were and we could have a some kind of normal trading relationship with Russia, then everything would be all right. And I think that just misunderstands how ideological Putin and Putinism really are. Yeah, and what, what strikes me in this anti-Western ideology in Russia, that it actually also a Russian intellectual tradition, because the paradox is that the ideas coming from the West... We can, we can talk about capitalism now. We can talk about Marxism in the 20th century. We can talk about the idea of the nation in the 19th century. We can talk about the idea of the centralized empire in the 18th century. All these ideas were shaping Russia. They were sh- coming from the West, and they, they turned into their opposites. So Russia was borrowing this idea from the West and then, then turning them against the West. The, the case of Marxism is probably the most remarkable one because uh, the victory of Marxists in Russia actually meant the victory of those in the 19th century who were uh, benevolent to, to the Western culture, the so-called uh, Westernizers, Zapadniki. But let's talk about Ukraine. Uh, we often ask a question here in Ukraine. Uh, of course, we rely a lot on, on Western aid, military and economic aid, but we also ask a question what we are giving to the democratic world. Do you think we can ask this question in this way? And if yes, what is the reply? I, w- I will give you my reply. I think that uh, Ukrainian struggle right now shows that demo- democracy can be strong, that uh, precisely because of the good things that are in democracy, primarily the resp- responsibility of citizens, the capacity to self-organize, Ukrainians are actually showing that they can withstand actually uh, the, the tyranny. So they may be, may be giving back the, the self-confidence to the democracy. What do you think? So it's true that um, uh, President Zelensky has, in a way, solved this kind of culture war that we've had, especially in America, but also elsewhere in Europe over the last uh, several years, which is a kind of idea that there's a war between, on the one hand, liberal values and on the other hand, some kind of notion of nationalism or patriotism. Um, and what the Ukrainians have shown um, under his leadership, what they've shown is that you can have both and that there isn't a, some kind of break between them. They're not in opposition to one another, that, um, that you can have a patriotic defense of the nation and of its liberal values. Um, and that is incredibly important. And it also explains why there is bipartisan support for Ukraine um, especially in the United States, where almost everything else is so there's a very, very polarized political culture. Um, you know, people don't agree about almost anything. And yet you can find both Republicans and Democrats on the same side you know, of this issue, or the majority anyway. Um, and that's been a really, you know, it's been a really important lesson you know, for most in most Western countries, uh, meaning Western Europe, and the United States, there isn't a memory of fighting for democracy or fighting for liberalism in recent, you know, in recently. I mean, the last time it really happened was 1945. Um, you could maybe other wars in between had some elements of that, um, but not as not so profoundly and not so successfully. Um, and so and, you know, so what you what Ukraine has done is reminded everybody of what these values are worth, the value of sovereignty. And here I use the real term of sovereignty, namely self-rule by um, by a nation, um, the value of democracy, the value of um, freedom, the value of, um, you know, f- freedom of speech and assembly and all those other things that go with it. 
and why and and showing people that there are some people willing to die for that. And that's been very important in particularly in the US where the you know there's been a rise in a kind of autocratic way of thinking, not kind of, sorry, a rise in autocratic thinking and growing doubts about the American democratic project whether it can survive. And so I think the Ukrainians have kind of injected a note of energy into those who believe that democracy is worth fighting for. I think that's very interesting what you said about this compromise between patriotism and uh, democracy or patriotism and liberal values, because this is indeed something which which I think the 21st century should look into, how to combine these extremes that are polarizing right now many societies in America, in Poland, in uh, in Britain. So the radical progressivism, I would say, and radical conservatism, and whether we can find a a, 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 a way to combine them um, to kind of a, uh, a harmony, or not not a harmony, but a balance or compromise between tradition and modernity. Can we really look at, at this? I think it's a very interesting thing, and Ukrainians really can 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 say something about this. Uh, but l- let's talk about the current affairs, maybe briefly. Uh, uh, one of the fears in Ukraine is, of course, that um, there will be Ukraine fatigue in the West. We always talk about this, and uh, uh, that y- the support to Ukraine from America, from Europe, will not be sustainable, and therefore. Uh, time actually plays on Putin's side uh, because Putin has much more resources. He can wait. Ukrainians cannot wait because we are relying so much on on on, on external support. What do you think? Are you optimistic about that, or or you are pessimistic? So right now, um, as we're speaking um, at the end of 2022, I'm optimistic. I mean, that obviously could change. Um, Because, I mean, right now, I think what you've just described is pretty well understood in Washington, but also I think in London, Paris, Brussels, other places, Berlin. Um, It's understood that what Putin is seeking is to outlast us and to, you know, to wait. That is exactly what he's doing is he's waiting for us to kind of give up. Um, And there is at this moment a determination not to let that happen. And this is, a you know, this is openly discussed when you go and see people in Washington who have some influence over this process, they say, yes, we know that's what's happening. Um, and we're determined not to, you know, for that, not to, not to let us stop. I mean, you know, my hope is that the, the European powers and others, you know, the Japanese, the Australians and other countries who are supporting Ukraine think hard over the next few weeks um, about what else can be done to restrict Russia's access to weapons and to any kind of economic trade. I mean, I, I still feel that our our sanctions aren't harsh enough and our, um, you know, we haven't done enough to cut Russia off because, you know, if it's going to be a waiting game, um, then there there's two aspects to that. One of them is support for Ukraine and the other is making sure that Russia is not able to replenish its armed forces or its army or its or its military supplies. Um, and I, you know, I do hope that we think along both lines. And I hope, and I know you you may disagree with this, but I also hope that while we issue these sanctions and while we, um, you know, you know, block Russians from 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 doing business in Europe and around the world, that we also begin to tell some Russians, look, you know, there is a there is a different future for you if you can make this stop. You know, there is a there is an alternative way for Russia to behave. There's an alternative way for Russia to be in the world. You know, start thinking about how to change, how to end the war, and then we can talk about having there be a different Russia. Yeah, I think the question of the different Russia is very important. I would say, uh, the, what 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 is my reproach, for example, to Russian opposition, uh, to those people who are abroad? Maybe I'm wrong, but I don't see from them any vision of the alternative Russia as a political project. What is the alternative Russian political project, meaning that what is the non-imperial Russia? Because it's a very difficult question. If we seek uh, a non-imperial Russia, that we mean that there should be a de-imperialization, that there should be a real fall of the empire in the way how French empire fell or British empire. 
And I, I don't really, I don't know if you agree with me, but I don't really see that uh, happening in, among the Russian opposition. But uh, let me ask you a, the next question about the next year. So the, the final question, actually. Uh, what do you think would be the most crucial things for Ukraine, Europe and America in 2023? Let me, let me first say that I, I do slightly disagree with you. I do hear members of the Russian opposition talking about a non-imperial Russia, Nobody really knows what that means. I agree with you there, because Russia itself is a kind of empire. It's not just ethnic Russians, as you know. Um, it includes lots of other peoples and nations. But I, but you know, this is a conversation I've had, you know, with Russians in exile in a number of different places over the last several months, um, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not lacking in, in hope. So I think there's. I think there's a future for that conversation and it's just beginning and I think it should be encouraged because Russia itself won't go away. So having it having it become different is very is very very important. Um what will happen in the next year is almost um I think it might be beyond my powers to be able to look into the future. Um I'm I'm afraid. Um it's clear to me that Ukraine is winning the war on the ground. Um, and it's clear to me that the United States and and its most important allies want Ukraine to win the war on the ground and at the very least want Ukraine to take back the territory that was lost since February. Um, and um, therefore, you know, the chances of that happening, I think, are, are real. Um, what I can't predict is exactly how many missiles Russia has and what other kinds of destruction they will do to Ukraine, you know, in the meantime, while that's happening. Um, I would say it's also my hope that the Ukrainian military success, and this has already started to happen a little bit, um, will be able, will begin to create political change in Russia. And it's already happened a little bit among the Russian opposition, as I've said. Um, you can see some movement inside Russia, but ultimately you'll have to have the Russian regime, whoever is in charge of it, decide, come to under, an understanding that the war was a mistake. Um, and that's when it will really be over. And that's when it will be possible to really speak to Russia and really, you know, have a negotiation that will actually end the war. Um, and I, that hasn't quite happened yet. Um, it's that moment when Moscow sees that it can't win. And that the amount of pain and suffering it's caused, even just to Russians, um, is too high. That then you'll be then you'll see a real turning point. And we could be days away from that, or we could be months away. And I just don't know. Anne Pobaum, thanks so much for joining this podcast. Thank you. This was an episode of Thinking in Dark Times, a podcast series by Ukraine World. I spoke to Anne Applebaum, a prominent American journalist and historian, about the deep roots of the Ukrainian resistance, the history of Russian totalitarianism, KGB politics, and the cult of impunity. My name is Volodymyr Yermolenko. I'm a Ukrainian philosopher and journalist and chief editor of Ukraine World. Thinking in Dark Times aims to make Ukraine and the current war a focal point of our common reflection about the world's present, past, and future. We try to see light through and despite the current darkness. You can support us at patreon.com slash Ukraine world. Stay with us and stand with Ukraine.